You don't want to have to go on a dozen different, you know, airlines to be able to figure out where you want to go. So Google Flights is an aggregation layer, or Kayak is an aggregation layer on top. But what does that do? It adds another intermediary to the play. And that intermediary is taking another cut. So you're just increasing the price of all of these goods. And then the alternative is take it down a layer below. Hello everyone, this is Gauthier Lamotte from Moon. I am your host and today my guest is Kirsten Pomales Langenbrunner, who is the co-founder of Talent Layer. Hi Kirsten. Hello, thanks for having me. With pleasure. So, first of all, can you explain to us who you are? Can you tell us where you come from, how you went into the blockchain sector? All these things I ask as a first question. Yes. All right. Um, so I have been in the blockchain space for the past four years, but I had a sort of non-traditional path in. So I actually started my career working in libertarian public policy for a bunch of think tanks and nonprofit organizations in the States, uh, mostly in Ohio. And I, um, you know, did that for a while. I was very passionate about, you know, trying to figure out ways to you know, audit, audit public policy and, and make it so that, you know, people could live their lives easier and not have as much interference in business and all of that, but eventually realized that, you know, that is uh, some momentum that's heading in one direction and you can't really do much about it. So I ended up um, getting into software. So I sort of abruptly quit a political job, taught myself to code, and then jumped into software startups. So I freelanced as a developer for a while, um, co-founded a two-sided marketplace startup, a data infrastructure startup, and eventually um, I stumbled into a blockchain governance workshop, which was very interesting to me because obviously being in libertarian circles, you know, you you know about cryptocurrency. I'd known about it for a while, but it hadn't been extremely interesting to me. But once I realized that, like, you know, this Ethereum currency, you could actually build software on top of it. That's when I was like, oh, ooh, this is something that's interesting because it's you know, you're basically able to create systems that are resilient to, you know, government actors, corporate actors, et cetera, and, and also that are trustworthy, which wasn't really possible before without having some sort of intermediary in the middle, like, you know, financial institutions and all of that. So I sort of became obsessed with that um, after realizing the, the sort of like collective organization nature of blockchains um, through that governance workshop. And that was sort of my, my path in. Um, so over the course of a few months, I ended up uh, like helping out the uh, guy that was leading the workshop, Thomas Cox, who designed the governance for the EOS blockchain, as well as a number of others. And um, that led to us co-founding a working group uh, with the IEEE on blockchain governance, growing that to 200 members um, across six continents, I think, um, and starting to do like consulting uh, with him on a bunch of enterprise blockchain projects, mostly like financial consortia and stuff like that. And that was amazing, but I ended up realizing over time that, um, well, basically the, the kind of stuff that I was trying to do in the enterprise blockchain space was also just, you know, pulling against momentum going in one direction because, you know, major corporate actors, they want to have their data be safe and a public blockchain sounds scary. So they wanted to all host their own private blockchains and Hyperledger or Quorum, but that's basically just a big slow database, not really adding too much value. So um, I ended up eventually um, moving over to the decentralized side of things um, and uh, worked for a while um, on a NFT marketplace SDK uh, with some friends of mine. We ended up uh, getting venture backing for that, growing that um, to like 15 team members and that's still going on. Um, but at the beginning of this year, I ended up like just sitting down and doing a ton of reflection on like the biggest problems that I've ever come across in the world, the things that I thought were the biggest things that were not currently being solved by blockchain technology that could be solved by blockchain technology. And I ended up getting back to sort of my roots as a freelancer and 
also just everything that I've ever encountered with hiring people because I've been hiring people for a long time, especially on freelance platforms. Um, and what stood out to me is why, why are we sort of copy pasting the same business model that we have in web two freelance platforms, web two labor markets in web three? Because if you look at like Brain Trust, for example, like Brain Trust is the shining uh, case study of like, you know, a really cool application of blockchain tech and hiring, but they have a one to one ratio of the protocol that they've built, which handles like user reputation, some financial elements and their platform. So if you have a one to one ratio of platform to protocol, isn't that still a silo of data? And it's like, they're sort of doing the same thing that the enterprise blockchain projects were like, yeah, maybe your protocol lives on Ethereum or whatever, but it's still the silo. So my question was, why can't we have something that looks more like DeFi for labor markets, which is, you know, like a Uniswap model where you have a bunch of like, you know, liquidity pairs living on a protocol layer, and then that's, you know, open, permissionless, uncensorable, and then you can have any infinite number of platforms building tools to help users interface with that, building a bunch of custom features, having their own differentiation, their own moats. And um, I ended up you know, doing a ton of research and talking to a lot of people building marketplaces, freelancers, hirers, and um, ended up finding a few projects that were sort of similar to this um, that had existed in the past for one reason or another, but there was nothing that really was solving the liquidity issues caused by these, these silos. Uh, and this is like literally the biggest issue in two-sided marketplaces. It's the chicken and egg problem. It's not having enough hires and workers on either side of a market. So with something that enables pooled liquidity, you can basically, um, remove the silos while still allowing marketplaces to you know add value capitalize on that value so that was the origin of talent layer and that was like april of of this year that i started uh like working full-time on this vision and since then um brought on a co-founder we uh started engineering in july and have grown into this massive open source effort. So we have like 19 contributors uh, as of right now and six core team members working on it full time. We have our alpha out and we have multiple marketplaces that are building on us right now, wow. going to mainnet with us in March. So it's been a wild ride. It's been a fast paced few months. Okay. so. How you, oh that's great because I was about to ask you uh, what talent layer is so you already partially responded so how you sum it up like in uh, in one line yeah so very very briefly talent layer is both a protocol and a developer toolkit for building labor platforms with pooled liquidity so the pooled liquidity comes in uh, sort of with once again the Uniswap analogy where you can actually have you know dozens and dozens of platforms built that are leveraging the same pools of user identities, work posts, et cetera. And the power that that gives these platforms is the ability to, when a user on one searches for JavaScript engineer roles, it's looking at the back end and the origin of those roles could be coming from, you know, dozens and dozens of different platforms. Yeah. With, okay. Yeah. Evens out the liquidity. So that means, for example, um, I could I could make myself a an equivalent of the fi uh, of Fiverr uh, using the talent layer tech, but this person I'm hiring on that Fiverr equivalent could also be on some other platform coming from uh, another Malt equivalent that uh, that is a competitor of, uh, of Fiverr and uh, maybe another one in Pakistan or one in France and they would all rely on the same blockchain to have the the biggest amount of develop uh, of um, hired people, right? Of people to Exactly. Okay, yeah. That's great. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of changing the dynamic within labor market places because right now, um, you know, you, you mentioned these are competitors, right? So the competitors are, uh, we'll say like most of their valuation, like even from a venture capital standpoint is in how many users have you trapped in your box? Mm -hmm. Um, but the issue with trapping users in a box is, you are constantly dealing with that chicken and egg problem. And even the biggest marketplaces like 
like mall or like Upwork or freelancer, they're not giving the users enough counterparties to work with. And that is evident in multi-homing. So multi-homing is when users have to use multiple platforms at once just to be able to find enough people to hire or enough work. So like when I was a freelancer, I was using like seven platforms at one point. It's even worse if you look at um, like gig platforms, which is sort of in the same category, like Uber. You know, how many times have you been in an Uber and you see them flipping through like, you know, Bolt or Lyft or different different applications just so that it could be worth their time to be on the road because they can't find enough people and just one alone. Um, and that causes poor poor user experience. It causes a ton of friction in the market. And overall, it reduces the quantity of jobs that are even happening. And, it so, all, and I assume even for the freelancers, it, it also oh, reduces ultimately the amount of users if they stay, stick to one platform. The, the amount It does. It's plans, horrible so. for user acquisition. You, you know, as a, well, as you know, we, because we've talked during a, um, a, few, a few conferences we met there. Um, as you know, I, I own a restaurant and one of our main problems is how to stick within the platform, uh, to, to stick um, to one platform or to switch between all these platforms because uh, yeah. every country has Uber Eats and a few others, like some don't have Uber Eats, but all of them have at least two or three, some, some have six. Um, in France, we have many of them. And there's a reseller in, in France who's just selling the, you know, an iPad that you use just with an in integrated API and the, they're just centralizing everything on one tablet so that you, yeah. don't, you don't have yourself to have five different iPads just to, to look at every order. Uh, but yeah. for the customer, it's all, all, already cumbersome because the, um, they have to switch between many, many platforms just to find the restaurant they like. Yeah. So th that's typically that the use case as well. Yeah, that's a really, really good example. So there are two ways that that entrepreneurs in general have proposed to solve this issue in gig marketplaces and, and work platforms. And that is uh, the, the first one, which is the, the common one is aggregation. So this is similar to like Google Flights, for example. You don't want to have to go on a dozen different you know airlines to be able to figure out where you want to go. So Google Flights is an aggregation layer, or Kayak is an aggregation layer on top. But what does that do? It adds another intermediary to the play. And that intermediary is taking another cut. So you're just increasing the price of all of these goods. And then the alternative is take it down a layer below. So that would be pooling the liquidity at a lower level, creating a shared backend. And the interesting thing with this is there's a lot of there's a lot of um, nuance to it because when you take things down to a lower level, like I said, you're, you're de-siloizing, you're sort of breaking up this um, this thing that was previously used as a moat, um, which is just cap capturing users. So it has to be worth these marketplaces, these platforms time uh, and worth, uh, you know, really just sharing the data. And the reason why it is worth it is because you can increase the amount of work that's done on your platforms. And uh, with this model, it's more of a, a public good model, uh, especially considering this is all blockchain. You can configure it to levy fees, whether a user is transacting just in your silo alone, like two users on the same platform, or if a user is transacting with the user on two different platforms. Hmm. Um, and this sort of like revenue sharing fee splitting is great in combination with the increase in frequency of work because you're, you're basically able to make more money by going with this alternative as opposed to keeping your silo where you have less work getting done and users constantly moving to other platforms and going back and forth. So for platforms, the advantage would be to not being subject to too much competition um... Uh, and to to get to be known more easily by the um, by the uh, the freelancers for freelancers the uh, the interest would be to have more platforms at hand and to be maybe paid more by those who incentivize them more and for the end users of course the um, the great incentive would be that they would have more freelancers at a, a better price also available for for their job did I get that great uh, clearly. So I would say the, the main benefit for the end users, so that being like both hirers as well as workers would be now you don't have to use seven different platforms. Mm -hmm. You could just use the platform that you like. 
that's also really good for the platforms because the platforms want to make sure that users stay with them. But right now, even though they're trying their hardest to keep users in the silo, the users are being forced to use other platforms because they don't have enough resources in that silo to meet the needs of the users. So it's really empowering the platforms to do um, to, to basically give the users what they need to have proper user retention. It's not about the users going and you know hopping around a bunch of different platforms. Maybe some people will do that, but they don't have a need to anymore. And people don't want to you know manage a bunch of accounts on different things. They would rather just use you know something they're familiar with and something that works for them. Oh yeah, we could even uh, even imagine a talent layer connect for for all those platforms for for the freelancers in the end. Well, I mean, that, that would be like an aggregation, but you, like, you don't need an aggregation because any of the platforms that you're, you're looking at, like they could have a broader range of you know, jobs that they're pulling in and user profiles that they're pulling in, or they could have a more niche range. Like, I mean, if, if someone wants to go and create a you know, marketplace that only looks at JavaScript engineers, then when you go to that marketplace, you're only going to be able to search for you know niche javascript related roles and and devs and and people that are you know capable in that area but also if you wanted to create something that you know behaves more like an aggregator that's just looking very widely at everything you can also do that mm. and do you imagine like um how would you convince for example uh, already a heavy hitter on the market such as fiverr or upwork would you would you uh, do you think they would be interested in using the, uh, this resource in, in the long run, or is it something they would protect themselves from in order to keep a um, semi-monopoly mm -hmm. or a place on the market? Yeah. So the the point at which integrating with a network like Talent Layer would be within the interest of these big players is when the network grows to a size where it starts becoming more beneficial for that larger marketplace to have access to that pool of users than, uh, than the risk to put their users in, basically. So with the big marketplaces, they're, um, they're still struggling with the chicken and egg problem, right? Like they know that they don't have enough liquidity on their platform alone. So what they do is every year they go around and they try to acquire new companies. So like, for example, you have Rappi, uh, which is a big food delivery. Um, and at, really, it's just a it's like a multi marketplace app that's big in Latin America. And they've just been going around and acquiring a bunch of different companies. Same with Upwork, um, like Upwork even was originated from like a merger with Elance and Odesk and, and then they rebranded. So there's a lot of precedent of these marketplaces going around and trying to eat up other marketplaces just to be able to sort of like, you know, bring in those user bases, try to solve the chicken and egg problem. Mm. But the thing is, you can't acquire an open protocol network. So if you all of a sudden have, you know, even 50% of the small to medium size gig marketplaces that are leveraging an open network, all of a sudden you can't just go acquire those to get their user bases. You, it's like you either have to integrate with the network or you just don't access that talent. And the interesting dynamic is, is if you have, you know, a, a lot of small to medium sized marketplaces that are leveraging this open network, those small to medium sized marketplaces, even though they do not have as much, you know, as much ad spend or as much, um, you know, really like resources in general as something like an Upwork they'd be able to serve their users better because the users don't have to hop around and try to solve the chicken and egg problem for themselves because they just have access to this broader network. And that broader network is like that that's compelling to users. It's better user experience. So as a freelancer, why would I go to a platform like Upwork when I can just use, you know, a platform that's tailored to me that I really like um, fitting my niche, but allows me to access like whatever things that I need. And the, sa and, and the same pool of customers and, uh, and the same pool of uh, freelancers. Yeah. Mm. And also uh, another interesting thing is, so, you know, even though eventually it, it very well might be in the interest of big platforms like Upwork, Freelance.com, um, Rappi to integrate with this, it also in the long run doesn't really matter because 
like in any sort of industry, you're always going to have users going to where the best user experience is. Um, and, and also like the hiring industry right now, because you have, um, you basically have this concept of unbundling. So unbundling is where you have like an industry vertical that was served by say one application or platform like, like Craigslist, for example. So Craigslist covered a bunch, a bunch of different verticals. And then you have a next generation of platforms that takes a single vertical and unbundles that into a brand new business. And then that business is able to target a niche and serve it better than the first one was, therefore expanding the market. And this just happens like over and over and over again. And it's sort of a cycle. So you basically at this point, um, like we've had a number of stages of unbundling in the labor market industry. And you have basically now all of these platforms and a lot of users that are using multiple platforms. So for example, with Upwork, like once again, because the chicken and egg problem is an issue, uh, a lot of the users of Upwork also have accounts on a bunch of different smaller, medium-sized marketplaces. What does that mean? That means that hypothetically, if you have enough small, medium-sized platforms integrating with you know, an interoperable network like Talent Layer, then you would actually be able to de facto acquire a lot of the user base of Upwork, right? Because if those users are also using these other platforms and those other platforms integrate, then, you know, hypothetically, you could take like a, a big cut of that overall pie chart that Upwork has of their user base. Wonderful. And are, are there like, is the protocol then uh, something that could be uh, declined in a few other um, other use cases as I, uh, I spoke about you know restaurants but there could be also many other platforms where people are just put in touch like even buying markets like you know uh, where people just sell their stuff or or do peer-to-peer -peer little announcements is the protocol already fit for that so the protocol is generalized for any sort of service relationship. So service relationships would include, yes, like you said, you know, restaurant delivery or task rabbit type things, like you're hiring someone to wash your window or, um, you know, niche professional platforms like, you know, hire your lawyer or telemedicine is another big one. Um, these are all, you know, humans providing each other's with services. Um, I would say specifically for like asset asset marketplaces, this is not something that we're planning on touching. I mean, hypothetically, if someone wants to fork the protocol and make a bunch of alterations one day, they can. <laughs> Hello, kitty. Yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm getting harassed. Beautiful, Nori. Um, yes, so yeah, so basically just services, but services is like, you know, it's a massive, massive sector. <laughs> it's like, you know, the the most naturally human thing to do, just like, you know, doing favors, taking actions for one another. Of course. And so that would mean that in, it could disrupt the service industry in the good the good way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like with with bringing in blockchain technology, you know, it, it's not only really beneficial for these platforms, but also for end users. Right. Because right now, for example, user reputation, it's all tied up in these silos. And what happens there is if you have, you know, uh, a marketplace or a few marketplaces decide that they need to ban a certain country's users, or if they need to, uh, you know, if they decide they want to shadow ban users for one reason or another, those users lose oftentimes like, you know, years and years worth of work history. And then they have to get started somewhere else. And you also have a lot of fragmentation of reputation, which is another inefficiency in hiring. Because if I'm a freelancer and I'm using seven platforms, I have my reviews separately on those seven platforms, which is bad for me because it means it's harder for me to get work. So with the, the system living at a lower protocol level, you can actually have unified identity across any number of these platforms which enables you to have your full reputation, like all of those reviews ever left for you, all the jobs you've ever completed within the network, um, living in an area that can be viewed by anyone, viewed by any platform. And that's huge for access to work. Um, 
because like one of the things that I've always found so magical about f like freelancing and gig work in general is you can literally be anyone on earth and you can go to these platforms and, you know, just teach yourself a little bit, just uh, enough of some sort of skill to add value. And you could probably go and find some work. Like for me, when I was um, getting started as a dev, like I taught myself PHP over the course of a few months. And I was like, I'm never going to be able to be able to like get work, but you know, I'm watching these hype YouTube videos and they're saying, go on Upwork, go on Upwork, you can do it. So I, I end up going on Upwork and making a profile, putting up some of the example projects that I've done while I've been like teaching myself. And within a week I got something. And once you get something, then you get a review and then you can get another thing. And then it's just like, you know, snowball effect from there. And that is, freaking huge for upward mobility globally. And like, I, I cannot tell you like how many people I, I know just like friends of mine that have had the exact same experience. Um, and especially like, especially in emerging markets where you don't necessarily have access to like, you know, high paid work in your region. Like you can go on these online platforms and be able to make so much more, uh, starting from point zero. And like that, that's the really important point. Like you can go from zero to, being able to like have, you know, an amazing career using this sort of technology. Yeah, absolutely. And th that's typically the, um, the kind of, uh, of business I really enjoy because, okay, uh, most of the time when I see new blockchain company projects, um, I would say 90% of the, of the blockchain companies either fall in one of the three categories, uh, these three categories, like one is we provide service for other blockchain companies like we're a yeah. marketing and community management company for your own company okay legit business for for people who, who have another one um second is okay people are motivated by fomo so we're launching a token or we're launching a business yeah. but basically the the whole the whole business's purpose is just to leech money from the investors and it's probably not going to earn any money but because yeah. we have um gullible people who are willing to invest and uh, uh, and they just want to be part of the blockchain industry so they they are going to invest no matter what and the third business i see no 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 sorry let me let me put the cat away <laughs> And because they and the third business, which is the one I, I I'm the most skeptical about. Well, the second one is the one I'm the most skeptical about. But um, I understand why people are doing it just um, out of the fear of missing out the mm -hmm. you know the, the blockchain train. But the third one is people basically doing a web two business just putting some web three on it but it doesn't solve any real problem like okay yeah. yes i'm do i'm doing this exact version uh, um, this exact competitor of amazon or whatever on the blockchain okay and so is it faster no it's not is it cheaper no it's not does it have more users no it's uh, no it doesn't but it has nft identities yeah Woo. <laughs> so yeah yeah m most of the time I'm, I'm i'm always skeptical about it because i uh, the sole purpose of this business is just to say that it's the blockchain and it's Web3, but basically if you sell your, your stuff by using the, the word blockchain, the only people uh, that are going to be attracted are the guys who are interested in the blockchain. And yeah. what I like with, the, with your project is that it's really genuinely solving a pain point because it's for any person who's been in the freelancing world, this is like this is very frustrating to see that you have for example five star reviews on fiverr but none on upwork and yeah this is um this is slowing down your uh, your credibility in your business and it's also very complicated to log on each of them or to have an account that you have to update every time every time you want yeah. to update your picture whatever and so what's the user experience say, say i'm a freelancer where do i go uh, so I assume there's one platform for me as a freelancer that is connected to your your layer, um, your primitive layer, and then this one is going to be exploited by other uh, high layer business uh, businesses that just put you in a relationship, put the freelancer in a relationship with the user. But how's the user experience? Uh, are you guys just building one website for uh, the interface and that's it, or is there a multi um, something else here? So talent layer is first and foremost like tools for builders, right? Mm -hmm. So talent layer does not actually provide 
say like a hire or a freelancer with uh, work opportunities or a platform. What we have is we have the protocol and then we have like a developer toolkit and SDK for building this new kind of interoperable marketplace. So with that being said, there are platforms that are building the things that you're talking about on top of talent layer. So right now, um, there are three platforms that are in development. There's one um, that is sort of a generalized freelance marketplace um, for the Avalanche ecosystem. There's okay. one that is a um, smart contract auditor marketplace um, that's specializing in this niche. And then there's one that's a developer and creative focused marketplace um, that is mostly launching into like the Lens ecosystem in that community. So with any of these, you'll be able to check them out in March because that's when they're launching. Um, because Talent Layer is currently an alpha on Testnet. So we're going to be going live in March um, on Mainnet. And then these three marketplaces that are currently um, in engineering with us on Testnet, they're also going to be going live then. Okay. But my question was more for, for the, um, the freelancer. You said that it simplifies their, um, their own experience, right? So that yeah. they... They basically have one profile that can be used by every every service provider. Did, did, I, did I get yeah. that correctly? Yeah, so here, here's an example of that. So if you are a freelancer and say you're in like the Polygon ecosystem, mm -hmm. so there are two marketplaces that will be launching on Polygon in March. So mm -hmm. if you go to one marketplace and you start working and building up your reputation, you do a few jobs, get a few reviews, um, if a hire is, you know, on another marketplace and is, you know, comes across your profile, like all of that information will be there and you don't have to do anything to mm. make that happen. You don't have to make an account over there. You don't have to do anything. Okay. That, that, that was just, what, why I was asking. Okay. Yeah. It's just like, if, if you think about it, um, from like a architecture standpoint, like if everyone is sharing a database then that means everyone's just reading in the, the same information. And of course, you can have platforms that maybe have additional information, like, oh, maybe this platform grabs your full resume or mm -hmm. has an extended bio or maybe like a creative portfolio of, or things that are like a niche to a specific sector. Maybe that's, um, you know, something managed by one marketplace. And that can create moats for marketplaces, by the way, by having like a lot of additional features like that. Um, but all of the most important core information on your profile, which is like you, you, so this unique identifier, the reviews that you've been left, the jobs that you've created and keywords, this is all at the protocol level. All right. And uh, how's it going then um, if a freelancer doesn't want to be associated with one one platform, uh, say for ethical reasons or whatever reasons, like maybe this platform is notably and uh, notoriously bringing um, high, over demanding customers, for example. Mm. I, I assume there's an escrow for funds in, uh, on all yeah. these platforms, so that, that wouldn't be a problem. But Web2 has already solved, solved that. You, you get paid as a freelancer when both the freelancer and the hire are... Uh, are satisfied but what happens if as a freelancer i do not want to be on one platform do i have the possibility to to be to opt out of these specifically mm -hmm. so basically platforms have the the right to read information um but they can't like write information on your behalf unless okay. you are taking the action so basically that was a bit technical so what that means is if you're a user and you know, you have platform A, you really like platform A, so you use platform A. You, um, when you're on platform A, you're taking the actions like post job, uh, create review, put money in escrow, release escrow. So all of those actions can only be done with your hand. Uh, but other platforms, they can read information from the blockchain and look at like, okay, um, this is a job that was posted by you, or this is a review that was left for you. but people can't like interact with those things unless you are basically consenting to it. Mm. Okay, well, uh, this answers the question. All right, so that's a project that has the potential to go out, uh, well, very far outside of the of just the service industry because there are many, many B2B2B platform or B2B2C platforms that are 
in crucial need of that because of the sheer amount of competitors on the market and yeah. it can be hard to choi uh, to choose for for all the people aside from the competitors like hirers and uh, and service providers but i can see already many many use cases outside of freelancing uh, that could be very interesting as well oh for sure oh yeah okay and so um what's for you what is for you the the type of challenges that the blockchain industry has to overcome in general to to get more mature to be to be more fit for business yeah so i would say just in general it's i don't know it's awesome to build tools that are sort of in the first category of, of what you were talking about when you broke down the industry which is you know say like DAO tooling that is serving DAOs or DeFi that is serving people that are already invested in cryptocurrency. Um, and I, I think that that's a natural part of, you know, market evolution. This is where we need to start. But the way that we really make blockchain have the impact that it, it will have and it needs to have on the world is we need to stop looking inwards at our own industry and we need to start looking outwards at like the macro problems that exist in the world and trying to build tools that are actually implementable to solve those macro issues. Mm. And that means, you know, despite, um, despite like, you know, some of the pains that a lot of us feel with interacting with, you know, existing corporations, existing companies, whatever, like maybe we think, oh, they're so old fashioned. Like we, we just want to stay in our little crypto circle. Like we have to, we have to work with those entrepreneurs that like, they know these other sectors. We have to empower them with the, the technology and the things that blockchain is able to facilitate. That's what we're trying to do with talent layer. Um, like obviously blockchain is complicated, but it's sort of our duty to try to make it less complicated to create layers of abstraction and also to just like explain things in a way that is compelling to existing industries. So like, for example, with talent layer right now, if you look on our website, like it is mostly tailored to your Web3 native audience. Um, but what we are planning to do within the next six months is sort of take take a step back and really look at like how can we articulate this in a way where we're just looking at the the biggest problems and hiring tech in general and and how we're solving that and it's something along the lines of um the chicken and egg problem is the biggest issue that marketplaces face this is the number one reason that marketplaces die and here is this technology that allows you to get over the chicken and egg problem through open data ecosystems and using like not not touching the word blockchain, not touching the word cryptocurrency. And in order to get to that point from from a language standpoint, that's easy. In order to get to the point where it's easy for people in that demographic to integrate, that's a little bit more of a hurdle um, because we for our, for us, um, we basically need to build out our SDK a lot further and make it super easy so that teams that don't have any solidity experience on all whatsoever can plug in and be able to you know leverage the the benefits of the on-chain escrow and the pooled liquidity for user profiles and all of that but have it not be complicated for them um and you know there, there are also similar parallels in like okay how do you bring DeFi to the masses well you need things like fiat on-ramp off-ramp you need to um be able to make the user experience really seamless. So, you know, I think that a lot of the stuff that a lot of the stuff that like Gnosis Safe is is doing with um, creating like multi sigs that basically enable like account abstraction without having an account be custodied by an intermediary, like stuff like that. So that there's like a fine line, I would say between, um, you know, creating good user experience and maybe sacrificing on some of the core beliefs of blockchain. Um, I think a lot of the prior examples, like over the past few years of account abstraction, where it's like custodied by a platform is not optimal. But what I'm seeing come out specifically over the past six months is a lot of tools that are enabling account abstraction and 
nice user experience, but also still maintaining the full custody with the user. So I think that, that that's the, the thing that we need to be moving towards. Um, but yeah, that was, that's just sort of the vision in general. Like in summary, we need to be building tech for the world, not our little insulated bubble. Yeah, that, that, uh, that's also my opinion. That's one of the uh, the weakest points of, uh, of many blockchain companies. They're yeah. made by geeks who just want to have like a great technological artifact, but that doesn't solve any problem, uh, any business related issue. So yeah. that's still a microcosm, uh, microcosma. And I think to get more mature, the blockchain world has to to get more people who are who have a sense of business instead of just a sense of technology yeah for sure all right well are there any other reflections you have regarding the blockchain world philosophically or regarding the future regarding regulate regulations or anything else mm. um so i mean sure i would say um just one concept that's very exciting to me in general coming from the political background is the idea of um like creating a new way of like organizing humans using blockchain technology like in a way that could complement or replace governments mm -hmm. so like for example um, Jared with Status talks about this a lot. Balaji, um, Sinvastian talks about this a lot. But um, it's basically the concept of, you know, blockchain can basically provide a way to trustlessly, on a global scale, like fund public goods and uh, be able to facilitate decision making across large groups of people, manage, um, manage you know, massive budgets and allocate those budgets to provide, you know, services to people. Um, and I mean, really, why, why do governments exist? So governments need to exist because we need to basically crowdfund money to pay for public goods uh, in an efficient way. And the previous way of doing this was, well, you have you know, this big institution, and then you give it a lot of power so that it could take money from the population and then, you know, allocate those to funding different things like roads or schools or healthcare. Mm -hmm. But it's not possible to do stuff like that without the intermediary. And if you can remove the intermediary, then you bring a lot more efficiency because governments are just these, you know, big money holes that, you know, the more power it gets, then the more power wants to take and the bigger it grows and and then it becomes this sort of inefficient thing in the end that ends up collapsing so basically providing alternatives to that is very compelling to me yeah that, that's one of the thing to uh, to remove the the third party responsible for trust so the protocol yeah. has to be flawless but yeah that's uh, that, that's one of the of the main uh, things at stake for, uh, for me but i'm i wonder if governments are going to relinquish any bit any teeny tiny bit of power uh in the future if there's such a technology available i don't think they will do that willingly um, i completely agree but, but I, I, th think... I think some of them will will accept because it's like um, a competition between governments as well it is yeah i mean like in the in the international policy sphere, you have basically anarchy because you just have a bunch of these independent actors. And like, even though you do have some international associations, like realistically, everyone is still out for themselves. Like you have these countries trying different things, competing with each other, competing to create good places for business, good places for people to live. And what's interesting is, and this is something that Balaji talks about, it is when you have the ability to organize mass amounts of humans and like fund, you know, initiatives of those humans using blockchain technology, then you end up creating scenarios where you don't necessarily even have to have like physical territory mm -hmm. uh, to have a nation. And there's actually precedent for a lot of nations existing without physical territory. So you have some in like, mind? Well, um, I mean, 
all the nations uh, of the Native Americans in the U.S. and Canada. Um, mm. A lot of them have like legal status as a nation, like recognized by the U.N. as nations, but maybe they have their territory taken away or they're not sovereign anymore. Mm. Um, you also have the Knights of Malta, which used to have yes. territory, but now doesn't have territory. So like it's possible for for that to happen and be sort of recognized somewhat. Um, so I, I would say with that, if you don't need to access territory, which is the super scarce resource on earth, but you could still have a nation, then this creates a way for us to have these like alternative governments that are opt-in as opposed to born into. Slightly off topic remark, but um, that's why I find somehow the um... Uh, the space treaty a bit despicable. I find I find it a bit uh, yeah, yeah, a bit uh, sensible for some reason. Like okay, you pr the the official reason is yeah, private companies shouldn't be able to uh, to appropriate uh, a part of uh, of space or planet or whatever. But then again, that means that basically, if you're the one telling that nobody should. Take, so, uh, take an unclaimed resource as a property, that means that you are de facto the proprietary, the, the owner of, of, whole, of the whole space. So I, I yeah. think that not now, because the technology is not here, but I'm 100% sure that in 200 years, or I, I don't know the timeline, but in a distant or not distant future, the people who will colonize space will necessarily question that kind of space treaty saying yeah you guys said that we cannot take property and take claim here but de facto you then decided that you guys were the owners and setting the rules so now we're claiming this property and declaring our independence and go yeah. and i think there will there will be a um probably a, a, a new kind of uh you know exodus but um with no human population there, so perhaps with, with the um, without the uh, the ethical concerns of colonizing a country, then this is going yeah. to be colonizing a, um, a planet. But I, I think this is going to be the problem as well of, of centralization of power. Yeah, for sure. Territory. Yeah. So I would say, like, as far as space law goes, like we have a parallel on Earth, and that's maritime law. Mm -hmm. Like, no one owns the seas. Uh, you can fly the flag of a country and have that country's laws be valid on your boat. If you come across someone else's boat, but there's no one there, it's an abandoned boat. If you come across an island that's unclaimed, you can claim it. It's very rare, of course, to have something like that happen. But I think that's what will be applicable there. But as you know, I was uh, involved in the Liberland project. And, uh, of course. Um, and there's this uh, international convention in uh, international law i guess that is the montevideo convention if i remember correctly mm -hmm. where there are four criteria that uh, that you have to respect in order to be a sovereign nation and be de facto recognized as a nation and um Liberland doesn't rec uh, doesn't respect that because croatia is preventing people uh, people from going into this territory uh, but mm -hmm. for example there's uh, there's an example like um, the Republic of Somaliland is a country that has three million inhabitants that has been respecting yeah. these four criteria of the Montevideo Convention for um, for years, like something like more than 30 years now. And they're still not recognized by the UN. So yeah. there is the theoretical aspect of, yeah, you have to, to have these impossible criteria. And... Uh, and even if you respect them, we're still the guys in power. So there will be some legal uh, legal yeah. battles. It, it reminds me that uh, that episode of South Park when the kid is like, okay, you will be, uh, the, the parents are telling the kid, you will be allowed to go to this concert if you can clean the, if you can just remove the snow from the whole uh, the whole garden and the uh, the whole alley and also bring back democracy to cuba and oh my gosh. Th that's this impossible task but the kid manages to bring back democracy to cuba and oh you're still you're still grounded young man you're not, still not allowed to go to this concert oh my I, I gave this to you because i didn't want you to be able to do it and yet you did it and i have this feeling with claimed resources and claimed lands and sovereign nations so maybe yeah, the blockchain tech can help with that, but that that would need a lot of work for for a whole civilization. 
Oh, for sure. I really need to see that episode now. That sounds hilarious. I forgot. Uh, I'll say, I forgot the name of it. It's uh, um, it, uh, it's one of uh, of the early episodes. Yeah. Nice. Any last word? Well, uh, no, just thank you so much for having me. And if you want to learn more about Talent Layer, check out our website. We're just talentlayer.org. Um, so, you know, we have a big open source effort. So if the kind of stuff that we're building is inspiring to you, always happy to have new contributors hop on board. And if you're looking to build work tech, check out the docs. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, everyone, for listening. You were listening to Mutual Knowledge. My guest was Kirsten pomales Langenbrunner, co-founder and CEO of Talent Layer. You can check all her social links in the description of the video, and you can, of course, check all the Talent Layer-related links in the video. Give them a high five on social media. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you.